I'm Topsy Jewell and I'm, can everyone hear me all right? I'm um, one of yes. a number of volunteers who runs Saturday Lewis. Um, it might actually, it might be an idea if everybody could put themselves on mute. Um, then we won't have background noise. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm one of the volunteers who runs CD Saturday Lewis, and uh, this event sadly been cancelled this year. Please do use the chat to introduce yourself if you'd like to. The schedule for this evening is I'll give a five minute introduction and this will be followed by Vivian who will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And again, use the chat for questions, please. So I've had an allotment and been saving seeds for a few years, but I only save the easy ones like chard and beans and peas and herbs and a, and a few flowers. And, but every year I collect a big jar of rainbow chard seeds and sow a new row around March while I'm still harvesting last year's crop, which I'll later leave to go to seed. And I love the continuity and connection of seeds. And last spring during the first lockdown, I left a big bag of seed packets of um, chard on my doorstep for neighbors to pick up. And all during the summer, neighbors who I'd never met before came up and said how much they'd enjoyed taking the seeds and planting them and, and growing the chard, which was really nice. So Lewis CD Saturday is a one day event and we usually hold it on the first Saturday of February. We hold it in the town hall and we regularly have around a thousand visitors. This year would have been our 14th year. The seed swap is at the heart of the event, but there's also so much more going on. People come to glean knowledge and skills from our talks and workshops. They find out, find out about community gardens in the area and projects, learn about wildlife gardening, pollinators, composting and seed biodiversity. And they buy from independent seed and plant merchants, meet other gardeners and eat delicious home cooked food. Seeds are a connector. Last year, with the prospect of our usual seed events in jeopardy because of coronavirus, Kate from CD Sunday Brighton and Hove got in contact with us, Bristol and Cambridge Seed Swaps, uh, to share and exchange ideas. And this Zoom talk is one of the outcomes, and I'd like to thank Kate and CD Sunday and Bristol Seed Swap for all their support. Seeds tell stories about all of our communities, and we'd love to hear your stories too, we don't have time for people to speak, but please write them in the chat. And if you have any questions, please write them in the chat too. And Kate will be keeping an eye on them and will read as many out as possible after Vivian's talk. Now to introduce our speaker. Vivian Sansor is trained in anthropology and art. She is the founder of the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library and the Traveling Kitchen. And she's based in Palestine and the US where she's speaking from today. Vivian, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Topsy. And uh, I'm also one of the people who likes to save the easy seeds, <laughs> including chards. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I just wanna make sure that, okay, I like that. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for you, for Jilly and Kate and CD Sunday. I'm really excited and honored to be speaking to you guys, uh, especially that I developed a, a very special relationship with some um, growers in England when I spent time in London in my art residency at Delphina Foundation. So it's, um, it's really wonderful to, to be with you, even if it's virtual. And uh, thank you so much for those who turned on your cameras. Uh, it's just really helpful to feel connected and not that we're talking to the computer. Uh, I see there's a Viv also. Hi, Viv. <laughs> uh, cool. So um, I wanted to, I guess, uh, share uh, my screen if it's okay uh, and share a little presentation with you and just please. Hold on one second while we do that. Can everybody see this all right? Yes. Oh, cool. 
Um, okay, I'm just gonna just check how we move slides. Oops, here we go. So um, I, um, as some of you and most of you may know, I am from Palestine and I grew up in Bethlehem in a small little town actually that's part of the Bethlehem district called Beit Jala. And where I grew up is, uh, or used to be, a quite a lush place in terms of uh, biodiversity, agrobiodiversity, a lot of uh, stone nut fruits, uh, a lot of uh, apricots, almonds. So my childhood really uh, consisted of a, a lot of this like natural uh, way of being. And so nature was my teacher, still is. Uh, we were talking earlier when we were trying to log in, uh, how to relax, you can put your hands in the air. And, uh, you know, I, and I was thinking how we're always either emulating trees or reaching out to them. Um, and obviously trees come from seeds uh, and how actually our relationship to nature uh, and particularly to trees and seeds uh, comes really from our ancient heritage from even when we were monkeys climbing uh, on top of trees and, and those trees were our homes. Um, but obviously today, in today's world, we cut them down and we build uh, disgusting construction that we call home, but actually they're just, for me, they look like our homes look like more cemeteries rather than homes. So uh, I say this because I think my work has been an attempt to come home whether it's me as a person who became an immigrant or whether as me as a person who is Palestinian of an indigenous people who are being um, basically killed off uh, or uh, as, as a human, human person uh, in the world as I think we are all feeling disconnected and really wanting to know who we are uh, again, like get to know exactly who we are. Um, but my story with collecting seeds uh, started when I was home in Palestine working on my thesis for my master's program. And then I was asked by a British lawyer actually to come and help with translation. Uh, he was translating a court case for a woman in the refugee camp in Bethlehem, a Palestinian refugee camp in Bethlehem, uh, where the woman's home was demolished. And uh, I went with him and we sat in the chicken coop of uh, this woman. Her name is M. Ahmed. And while we were sitting in the chicken coop, uh, we were sitting in the chicken coop because their home was destroyed. And so uh, that was where she was sleeping with, uh, with her husband and uh, her grandchildren and her uh, daughter-in-law. Uh, and she had also lost two of her children who were killed. Uh, one was killed and was, one was imprisoned for political reasons. And her house was demolished. But as we were sitting there and I was translating, uh, Arabic to English and vice versa. Uh, Im Ahmed kept bringing these delicious spinach pies to our chicken coop, to her home basically. And, and the spinach was so delicious um, that I had to ask her, you know, Im Ahmed, where is, where is this coming from? Like, you, you know, we're sitting in a refugee camp and I'm getting these fresh pies uh, and fresh spinach. And uh, she took my hand and took me to the back of the chicken coop and on the ruins of her home, she had started this little garden where she was growing food for her family. And that was really actually about more than 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago that this happened. And uh, that story never left my heart because I felt if Im Ahmed can do it, then none of us have any excuses uh, not to um, and so I started my journey to learn more about agriculture, which 
I had learned about as a child with my grandmother and, and in my you know village, but I I was so disconnected from it as I grew older and I went to college and I, you know, as many people, we we are taught that we need to go to the cities to become, you know, whatever, more educated, uh, which that idea is very challenged in my mind today. Um, but then I got to learn more about our seed heritage. And, and as I started to look into seeds, I started to become more and more fascinated. I was like a little child or, you know, like, <clears throat> or maybe like a little astronaut moving into the world of seeds. And as you can see, this is uh, an image of <clears throat> spinach seed, uh, which is my first spinach seed harvest. Uh, especially for you, Topsy here. <laughs> and uh, I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, what is this? I mean, obviously you can see this is a cluster of seeds together, how they're clustered together and how they're spiky, very different than the commercial um, uh, spinach seeds that are very smooth and pebble-like. Uh, these were kind of spiky, as you can see, and uh, I felt like I was moving into another world of like, a, this is a new planet, uh, very cosmic looking here. And so I started to learn more and more about seeds. I became fascinated with this like small world of image and also like the magic of, uh, and the wonder of, of, of something that is so tiny that looks almost dead and you put it in the ground and all of a sudden you have food you know not just for you but for other people and I'm sure many of you here are growers so you understand and you personally experience this magic um, and the idea that we are all seeds everything is, is kind of like almost a seed so um, I started to want to learn more about my own seed heritage um, in a in a time and a place for me as an indigenous person who for so long as a Palestinian, especially when I came to live in the United States and when I would travel in Europe, people would ask me, where are you from? And I would say, I'm Palestinian or I'm from Palestine. And many people would look me in the face and say, oh, well, Palestine doesn't exist. So I couldn't really consolidate how the world saw my world or where I come from and even me with what I knew. I, how could I not exist? I know these seeds. I grew up in these terrains. I know so many traditions that actually go back millennia. And so I started to meet more people and more farmers um, who actually, like this farmer here, his name is Jadua, which actually means uh, which is the name of a watermelon that had <clears throat> almost disappeared. And uh, I had heard about this watermelon while doing my research uh, where people would tell me different stories about how this giant watermelon named Jadu'i uh, grew uh, in the north of Palestine and, and, and it grew with zero irrigation. And it was part of a, a series of crops that we put in the ground. We call them Bali crops, and Bali refers to the Canaanite deity of fertility. And imagine from more than from thousands of years ago until today, we use the word Bal to describe these uh, crops that have been developed in our microclimates to grow with zero irrigation. So we just put them on the, in the ground in the right time, we prepare the soil and poof, you know, all summer we have, for example, okra, tomato, watermelon, like this one I'm telling you about that grow with no irrigation. And so I started looking for this jadu'i that people told me had disappeared. And many would tell me that actually, you know, I'm looking for the dinosaur because nobody's growing it anymore. Uh, and years went by while I was trying to, to just, I want to taste it. Like, how can you tell me this is my history, but it's gone. And so I kept looking for it. And um, finally, I met this lovely person named Khadr Abu Ghattas who 
I just mentioned it to him and he said, oh, you want the Jadduai watermelon? I have the seeds. Uh, and he opened this drawer you see in the slide, the everything drawer, it had everything from hammers to nails, clippers, uh, tweezers, you know, all pill boxes, as you can see. Uh, and he started taking out the seeds, one seed at a time. And he said, take them, nobody wants them. And, and, and that was a really, really bittersweet moment uh, and a defining moment really, because he said, take them, nobody wants them. And so I, I still ask this question today, what does it mean for us not to want who we are. I mean, this seed developed through the genius of our ancestors who applied art and imagination, science, observation. As many of you are growers, that is exactly what you do. You, you, you decide every time you select that you want to grow this variety and not that variety, you are making a decision for the future. And you're also obviously contributing to the diversity of the future. And that diversity is built on diversity that was given to us and passed down to us by uh, the people before us. So as I delved more into this and I started working with uh, different growers and farmers to discuss and try to replant this history that people tell us it's the dinosaur, give up on it, it's not important. Uh, so that you know we buy whatever the monoculture that's available in the supermarkets. Um, I started to understand that actually in order for me to understand this seed and this agrobiodiversity, I must collect the stories. And uh, the main thing I always like to mention is that, you know, today we have a seed library with nice jars and everything. Uh, but the truth is what we're doing is hardly innovative because that's what our grandmothers always did, except they, the seeds lived like you see in this image in old tin boxes. Uh, old, this is a quality street chocolate box. It's very famous in Palestine. Everybody finishes the chocolate. It becomes a seed library or uh, a sewing uh, kit. Um, and so I started looking for these stories and traveling around the country looking for these stories. And with each seed variety, even this uh, here, uh, this is a lovely man. His name is Hamode. He's 104 years old. And uh, he surprised me when I visited. I was looking for wheat varieties. Um, but he actually was showing me his tobacco, a tobacco he's been growing for 50 years. He's 104 years old. So you can imagine he's had time to develop his own variety. Uh, and he was so proud of it. And I had like this, like, I didn't think of tobacco like in my own culture or, 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 but he had these stories and it was so valuable to understand who we are today. We really have to understand who we were so we can be better designers, obviously for the future of what we want. So um, I started to collect more stories. Uh, this is one of the stories I love so much. Uh, this lovely lady, her name is Insami, and uh, you can see this beautiful cauliflower that uh, she has on display. She's from a village close to my village, and she comes to the city of Bethlehem to sell her produce every Saturday. And uh, this cauliflower uh, sits, the seed sits in the ground for literally nine months. Again, zero irrigation. Uh, so you have a seed variety that sits in the ground for nine months. It's like having a baby, literally. Uh, and for us to lose this variety would be such a shame for, for the whole world. And, you know, you can actually, like, it's such a, it's also a unique variety. It's very sweet. It's delicious. And again, it's, it's really full of nutrients and it's disease resistant. Uh, you can see how this Zahra Baladi, we call it, uh, this beloved cauliflower, 
is truly, truly uh, beloved. And, and this tradition of actually uh, farmers coming to auction there, it's like a beauty pageant for the cauliflower. And uh, they come and they auction uh, their flowers. They, they, they auction them out. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dying tradition but um, to see it still alive in any form is, is just so beautiful. And, uh, and these are also stories and practices that we can learn from today as we are also facing a lot of economic hardship as you know, we're being pushed into economic systems that are not fair and don't give farmers and growers power over the price of, of the produce or or, or even the quality, but as growers, we are the ones deciding what people, we need to be the ones also like co-deciding or working together with, with people who cook, with people in their kitchens to decide that we want agrobiodiversity. We want that biodiversity on our plate. Uh, this is, so the, that was the cauliflower. Another crop that uh, I've been working on a lot is this uh, wheat. Um, <clears throat> Palestine is a center of diversity for wheat and barley, uh, ancient wheat and barley. So, you know, the world eats cookies and drinks beer because of the genius of our human ancestors in, in the Fertile Crescent and uh, all of that area, Iraq, uh, Jordan, uh, Syria, Palestine, because that's where uh, farmers developed wheat and barley. And this wheat variety is an ancient variety, uh, which we call uh, Heti Yisoda but many people colloquially call it uh, Abu Samra and Abu Samra literally means uh, in Arabic, uh, like dark and handsome. When you're flirting with someone, uh, you, you call them Abu Samra or something like that. And uh, I fell in love with this variety. As you can see, it has these uh, black whiskers and uh, it's, it really felt so appropriate that whenever I talk to farmers, they would refer to it as this long lost love. And so I started working with farmers to bring it back to the field, but also to tell its story so that people start to want it because from the hundreds of varieties of wheat today, we only grow mostly two varieties that are commercial varieties. And this ancient variety is dying because people are just uh, not asking for it. And so we've been growing it and uh, we've developed a, a, a song with a local artist about, uh, about this long lost love. So it's a love song, uh, but actually it, uh, it, it kind of excited a lot of uh, young people to call and want to uh, eat and taste this, uh, this story of their own ancestors. And, and, and this story has a lot of meaning uh, for me in particular, uh, because I, I really wanted people, uh, especially young people in Palestine to celebrate their heritage, to celebrate who they are, to, to know that uh, the colonial story that we are worth nothing, that we have to be more like other people, that we, um, we have nothing to offer the world is actually not true. And, we have something amazing to offer the world. We have these uh, rain-fed crops. Uh, we have these, like I said, the Bali crops. We have this amazing weed that grows in a semi-desert area uh, with, again, zero irrigation, super disease resistant. And so this farmer, Khaldun, here in the beginning, uh, I asked him to, uh, to plant an acre of, uh, of this wheat. The first year he was extremely resistant. He said, I don't know, I'll do it, whatever. Uh, but nobody wants this. Why do you want me to waste my time? And when it was time to harvest, he actually called me and said, I'm sending my sheep to graze your wheat because it's uh, nobody wants this wheat. Nobody even like knows it. And uh, I said, I don't know, whatever it takes, please don't do that. And he said, you have to pay me to, to not do that. So I had to find money to, to pay him so that 
he doesn't uh, uh, send his sheep to graze them. Uh, but uh, the year later, one year later, after we uh, developed the story, but we also developed the song with this young artist, um, he started getting phone calls of, of people wanting this sweet. And so you can see now he is thrilled last year because uh, now he wants, he calls for more seeds every year. And in fact, now I call him for seeds because now he has more seeds than I do. And um, these stories I'm telling you, uh, I think a lot about, you know, why I do what I do and actually what is it that I do? Like it's kind of like, what is it? I'm a storyteller, I'm a farmer, I'm, what am I? And then I realized uh, that actually it made a lot of sense that I am neither and both at the same time. My paternal grandmother was a great, great storyteller and my maternal grandmother was a fantastic farmer. So in a lot of ways, I came to understand that I am like the many seeds we put in the ground. I'm also the offspring and I carry the DNA of my grandmothers. Um, and thus, this is, I guess, what I do. I'm no different than the seeds that I cultivate. And so, here we go, uh, where I combined both basically my search for seeds with my love for telling stories and using the arts as a way to express these stories. And this is the first launch of uh, the seed library in the village of Batir, where our center is today. There's a sound. Okay. Um, and um, this is a display that we did. I engaged uh, young students in basically going to talk to their elders to, to figure out, you know, what is their seed story? Uh, and obviously different students, I worked with students, uh, with basically the teachers actually, from different uh, counties and districts in Palestine. And so people had different uh, varieties that they talked about. Uh, but the wonderful thing that happened in this experience was that uh, young people actually sat down and talked to their grandparents, their elders. And that was amazing because, um, you know, the way our society is set up today is that, you know, everything is compartmentalized. You know, you, you, the young people do this, the old people do this, the whatever people do this. And so this intergenerational connection that helps us learn, this is how we learn, which is what, how we learn better than we learn in school, uh, it was being severed. But through this exercise, a lot of young people said, you know, we never sit down to chat with our grandparents, but this helped us do that. And they expressed it in different ways. Some took videos, some pictures, some wrote a story. And so that allowed us also to learn about what was there and, and, and what we want to work on. Another um, thing uh, that uh, has been really amazing uh, experience, which is that working with farmers, I, I also realized that we need to engage a bigger and wider audience in, in, in this conversation about agrobiodiversity. And so I wanted a kitchen that uh, has wheels and can travel to different places. And so I collaborated with uh, my lovely partner, Aid Arafe, who is an artist, and he constructed this lovely kitchen. Uh, and actually this kitchen comes apart and fits in my car and I can travel to different places. I set it up. And it just kind of operates also like a seed in terms of like being a catalyst to bring a conversation. And so people kind of like, what is this? Uh, and then you end up talking about what you're cooking and usually we're cooking heirloom varieties. Um, and it helps people kind of engage in a conversation and exchange about um, what, what we're eating, why we're eating what we're eating, and why we're choosing what we're choosing to do. Because a lot of people 
like one time a um, couple of guys came to actually to this very specific moment and they're like what are you cooking beans um no meat and we're like yeah we're cooking heirloom beans and in the beginning they were like you know they they work obviously in a bank or something they were wearing a tie and really uh they come from villages around but they 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 sadly weren't proud to say that uh, but at one moment uh one of the guys said oh we are the people of the beans and then the other guy said no we are the people of the beans and then the three of them engaged in this kind of uh competition like who are the people of the beans but that was an amazing moment because these guys who came very shy to this cart uh suddenly like was were very open about who they come from uh, where who yeah <laughs> where they come from and their their heritage and they felt proud of proud of it and and they felt so validated to see people in the middle of the city cooking uh what their grandparents and their mothers cooked um this is uh speaking of our grandmothers this is uh, me uh, foraging for uh, mallow leaves uh, here in california uh, you can see the ocean the pacific on the background and so this is a a, a park in uh, in los angeles area and uh, you know it's it's a park where this lovely uh, mallow grows and since uh, california is also a mediterranean climate um, and this grows in Palestine. So I grew up eating this uh, plant. Um, and so when I found it, I became so excited and I started collecting uh, more and more of it. And that day, uh, <clears throat> the workers who were mowing the, the grasses came and they were mowing it down. I mean, this is like my food. You know? How can you be mowing it down? Uh, and so uh, it really got me thinking uh, about, you know, how culture and, and the way we, we grow up with plants and we co-evolve with plants really informs us and informs how we see the world, how we see diversity. And moreover, for me in this moment, I also got to think a lot about how as a Palestinian, our homes, our, our foraging spaces, our biodiversity that we grew up with and we co-evolved with uh, is being destroyed and it's being systematically destroyed and on top of it uh, are these settlements that are being built that have nothing to do with the natural terrain and that same day my parents i called them they live in north carolina also in the united states uh, and they said what you found the khubeze we call it khubeze uh, you have to put it in the post for us. We we need to we need to have it, and so the idea that you know your culture travels uh, through plants as well, and how even if you have all your necessities, you know, if you will, in in another country, uh, your relationship to a plant and how it reminds you of who you are and it declares who you are is un it's not something that can be compared or changed. And so um, this also brings me to a very important story, how a lot of things that, you know, in a lot of communities around the world are taken for granted are really, really a matter of life and death for other people. And um, this, these, uh, this, this picture uh, to the left is a picture of, um, a Palestinian farmer in Palestine who's foraging for this khubbeze that I easily foraged for in California. But as you can see, the very simple activity of foraging for your own food as an indigenous person who knows the terrain, who lives in harmony with this nature, uh, for someone who doesn't know the terrain and who's an instrument of a colonial power, for them, you are a security threat. Um, and for us in Palestine, foraging for our food, continuing to have a relationship with our food has become 
literally uh, a danger to our lives because many people have been shot while trying to forage for, for, for things that have been traditionally part of our cuisine. And so we have been a culture that is very much our cuisine based in foraging and actually living in this um, mutual reciprocity relationship with nature. Today, we are struggling just to, you know, keep a taste of, of the things that we, we grew up with. Uh, the middle picture is uh, also a picture of um, some of the dearest people in my life, my friends and my cousin who we found this loof, which uh, is another thing we forage for. And we were so happy because also foraging spaces have been limited for us now where we can go and our movement is fully restricted. And so we were very happy that day that we were able to find some. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to... And this also brings me to the idea that when you really think about it, the only time a plant can travel is a seed. And that's how um, different plants have made it all over the world. This is how uh, we are eating tomatoes everywhere, even though tomatoes actually came from South America. Uh, this is how we uh, today, you know, exercise more and more uh, uh, biodiverse uh, gardens is because, uh, you know, birds and humans and uh, seeds that have developed wings <laughs> uh, come to us. Uh, 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 And, uh, and so I just want to share a few examples of how our seeds kind of developed wings and flew around the world. Uh, here, uh, uh, the first image of our Palestinian fava beans. Uh, they were fava beans from our seed library that somehow flew and landed in California. And uh, today they have inspired a community of people in Oxnard, California to start their own seed library. And uh, they made, <clears throat> they have this, now they have a third generation Palestinian fava beans uh, growing in Oxnard, California. And they've adapted really well here. And obviously this is important because um, as we're facing climate change, as we're facing a lot of changes in the world, uh, having um, varieties that can adapt and that are disease resistant to different climates uh, is very important. And as farmers, we really need each other to exchange information and learn about how to face a problem that's really attacking all of us. Uh, the second uh, um, uh, image is an image of yaktin, which is a, a, a green gourd that uh, we grow in Palestine. It's a really amazing uh, summer crop. And I imagine actually it would do really well in England. Uh, because And it's really, really good for um, protecting your other summer crops from diseases. And um, we collaborated this year with the Hudson Valley Seed Company in New York. And uh, we do, and, and the, the seeds grew in New York like crazy. And now we have these seeds available at the Hudson Valley Seed Company website. Uh, but they also tell a story. The, the cover of this uh, seed packet, it's an art collaboration. Uh, we commissioned a young artist in Palestine, in Jericho, and she made a painting when we told her about the Aktin. And again, this is a young woman who didn't really care much about farming, but, but she's an artist and she got to learn more about her own bioculture through this uh, experience. And now we have this beautiful art uh, packet that has our yaktin um, and it's also traveling obviously around the world with people ordering it and planting it in their gardens. Uh, so we are, hopefully contributing somewhat to sharing it and keeping this heritage variety alive. 
uh, while also sharing this joy of having it in the world. And it obviously tells the story. Uh, I don't know if I'm running out of time, I'll try to be quick, but uh, <laughs> another uh, seed sharing story around the world uh, has also been um, a really dear one to my heart. I collaborated with um, a gardener in, uh, in London, in, in Croydon. His name is Isaiah Levy, who had seed share and he shared seeds with me. And uh, maybe some of you know about him. He passed away January of two years ago. And uh, I've taken his seeds uh, to Palestine and been able to tell his story through his seeds and keeping his legacy alive. And finally, even your royal family became really interested in our seeds to the point where Prince Charles, when he came to Palestine last year, he visited us. And uh, today, uh, a collection of our seeds actually have traveled with him uh, to England and he's growing these seeds in his garden uh, in, uh, in England. So, uh, he was really excited about having these seeds, I must say. Um, so anyway, I just want to wrap up by saying that uh, why I'm talking to you from California, I'm a Palestinian and you're in England, uh, is because um, for us to face the global challenges we're facing, uh, we really have to come together as a global community to talk about how we're going to design a better food future for the future generations. We can't go back to the past. And uh, we obviously, I think, should not and cannot tolerate the current present. So how can we together imagine a more life-giving future through seed diversity and, and through working uh, in our lands and with nature? So thank you for listening to me and I'll uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll stop sharing screen and hopefully if we have Thanks. time, I'm happy to receive questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian. That was wonderful. I think, Kate, you found a couple of questions. Yes, and keep them coming, everybody. But um, Vivian, I have a few questions I'll tell you all at once. So one is from Emily from Sustainable Kirimiel Market Garden in Scotland. Um, she's also starting a seed library as well. And she, she wants to know if you've got a book um, with the stories and the names of the seeds. Uh, um, Emily, you're, you're hitting a, 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 a painful chord because I, <clears throat> it's been uh, more than three years I'm working on a book. And actually, today is my deadline to submit finally, uh, uh, you know, my, my book proposal that I've been postponing and I'm still stuck on the first paragraph. So uh, I'm working on it. It's, uh, it's really hard when it's your stories, it, uh, you know, to put them together. Uh, I'm very critical, obviously, as I'm writing, but I've written a few articles, but I'm currently right now uh, working on a book. So thank you for giving me the other kind of incentive to. Yeah, just think of Emily and, and, and all of us. All of us, we want to see your book. And then um, there was a couple of other questions. Well, from Emily was also, uh, what, what's the name of that cauliflower um, as the variety? Although my question might also be, would that kind of cauliflower variety grow okay in England that, that well let's try yeah 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 what's yeah. that just do you know the name of the variety that, that is yeah well we call it Zahra Baladiye and the Zahra means flower and Baladiye means heirloom so it's just called Zahra Baladiye if you can put the know. name in the chat yeah, I can that write it down right be here. great right. and then a couple of people asked um uh how do you eat mallow <laughs> what's the name of the mallow I think, uh, and how do you eat it? Yeah, it's a common mallow and uh, I'm pretty sure it grows in England. It does, uh, it does grow a lot and it grows in Sussex. Yeah, and actually in California, I've been busted by people because I go, it grows like on the side of the gates where like, 
and they're like what are you doing at, <laughs> at our gate and I'm just like I'm waiting for you um um yeah it's very very easy obviously you want to make sure you co collect it somewhere where they're not spraying I, there's a lot especially in the cities it, it still grows but you know people use glyphosate like crazy um and ice you wash it um chop it up uh olive oil is our you know sacred uh ingredient um we uh, and actually you have a lovely uh, company in England called Zaytun. They bring olive oil from Palestine. Uh, you can check them out. Uh, but anyway, I chop up onions. I saute the onions in the olive oil, and uh, and then I add the the mallow. And you can add a little bit of water and just kind of let it simmer for twenty minutes and. Voila, and then, oh, don't forget to squeeze some lemon on top before you eat it. It's really, really simple. That's but it's great. so delicious. Yeah. I'm writing about Zaytun in the, um, so somebody else has also asked um, about the the song about the, the, the dark and handsome wheat, Zaskia from CD Sunday. Yeah, let me uh, look it up. Am I still sharing screen? You're not, but if you put it in the chat, then um, people will see it. Um, okay. And then there's also uh, a question about, well, it's the same question as you, you sort of answered what let's see, but it, well, the question was about how well do you think the seeds travel across different um, uh, agro climates? Um, I'm, I mean, my view is that we're starting to get more like a Mediterranean climate in Brighton and Sussex. I know that not everybody online is in Sussex, um, but actually some of these some of these seeds that are more drought resistant uh, and, and able to manage without irrigation would be very useful, I think. Um, I'm starting mm -hmm. to think that way on my own allotment. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's again, like why we're here talking together, right? Because, um, you know, predictions are the hottest, the coldest places are going to become some of the hottest places. So it's possible, you know, and that's why we will, I mean, I hope we, ha we don't go there, but that's already happening where we have climate migration. So, you know, just like people will migrate, seeds will migrate because uh, what we, you know, what, what we're growing in Palestine today might be with climate change possible to grow in England tomorrow. So you know, just we just have another question actually about, about no watering. I wonder if this is possible. Do you have a tomato that needs no watering? Absolutely. And it's one of my favorite crops. Wow. Uh, it is amazing and it is delicious. And put the, uh, put the name in the chat. <laughs> Uh, well, also, we just call it our heirloom tomato, uh, Bambora Baladie. Uh, and a couple of years ago, uh, it was one of the main things that we worked on. Mm. And I'm hoping that soon I will have it in seed packets as well to share with everybody. Mm. Uh, but we, it's, it's, it's just very expensive and, and, lit and it's a lot of work to get it to get a lot of it out, uh, just because we, you really need space and you need, um, it takes time, it doesn't, uh, uh, and we have a big problem in Palestine with accessing a lot of our lands and we're having really, really horrible time with settlers. And so the place where we're growing these tomatoes um, is becoming more and more kind of difficult to access. Uh, but uh, it is a tomato that actually we put it in the ground, the seed in the day of St. George, which in Palestine, it's May 6th. Okay. And it just grows and it lives off of the dew and uh, the, water, the moisture retained in the soil during the rainy season. So actually having rain while it, it's in the ground is not good for it. Mm, wow, it actually doesn't like the rain. She doesn't, and we call them thirsty crop. We like thirsty crop; they're very flavorful. But mm. it is, it is, it is obviously taking water from from the soil and uh, from the dew. And again, climate change along with political reality are kind of a bad combination for the survival of these seeds because 
we're having uh, less Jew also, which it's mm -hmm. zero. Another question is, um, can you just tell us a little bit more? We've only got five minutes or so left, but somebody would like to know a little bit more about how your seed library works and also whether or not we can give seeds to your seed library. Is that possible? That would be amazing if you can figure out how to get them to us. Um, uh, our seed, seed library works really randomly. Uh, it is not an institution with organized files or anything like that. Uh, and it's totally a communal process uh, and also depends on, I have to be honest, like kind of what I fall in love with, I start to focus on and it becomes a big part of what's in the jars. Uh, there are certain varieties that are always there uh, like our heirloom zucchini uh, and the tomato, I, I, I try to make sure we always have it, um, mostly these Baal crops. Uh, but uh, like this year, we ran out of seeds because people just kept coming during the pandemic, uh, just taking seeds. And, I'll, and I, I don't even know who they are. They just take the seeds and we'll bring more seeds, someone else will bring seeds. It's not a very organized process, uh, but it is, um, I hope, I believe, a very loving and open process if people show up. Uh, if I'm in, in the field and I see people and I have seeds, I just give seeds. I, it's not a, you know, we're there if people come and want seeds, but it's not, uh, and in the beginning we, we're very intentional in how uh, we wanted to, which, which varieties we wanted to focus on. So the tomato actually was one of them, uh, the wheat and a kind of a white cucumber and um, the watermelon. Uh, Obviously we'd love seeds from people. Uh, I don't know how, I mean, before people would travel, but I don't know today how we would do that. Yeah, and uh, do, would things arrive by post? Well, we have a challenge uh, in Palestine with that. We don't, Okay. like I don't, we'd have to have someone's address in Jerusalem and it's kind of, we can't get mail easily as well. No, is. of course. And there's also problems actually with sharing biological um, material. I mean, I'm not doing that. They just fly by themselves. Of course they do. No, I have no, I have never taken any seeds across borders. <laughs> um, so um, somebody's also mentioned, by the way, just worth looking out for those of us in Sussex, the Polytunnel Project. Um, is in East Sussex near Upfield, and they have a wet, they have a they have a, a Facebook page. If people are interested, it's another it's a community project. So check it out. Uh, uh, there, uh, please look, share share. It with yeah, you. Polytunnel Project um, on Facebook. Um, so we're coming to the end. Um, so let me hand back to Topsy if you want to say anything and and allow a few minutes for some final words from Vivian. Yes, thank you. Well, really, I just want to say thank you, Vivian, for so many fantastic ideas and inspiring examples. Really love them. And it just made me wonder a little bit about how how CD Saturday could actually uh, become better at telling stories about seeds. I think we do so much sort of um, sending seeds out there or focusing on the growing or the wildlife, but I think we rarely actually sort of stop and think about the actual seeds that we're, we're well, maybe it's just me, but sort of working with and the stories that are around them. Um, and particularly the sort of more, the, the seeds that have been um, developed over many years locally. I, I, you know, I just, I don't know how many, how many examples there are out there and it'd be really lovely for us to gather more of that. Um, I was just really quickly to say that I'm going to send out a follow-up e uh, email uh, probably tomorrow morning or later this evening and we've got a very quick feedback survey and it'd be really lovely if people could do that if they have time 
and let us know particularly ideas for future talks and if, if particularly if you've enjoyed this one and there's also links in there to um, Bristol Seed Swap have got three talks coming up next weekend which all look absolutely fantastic and there's links there to booking onto those which, and they're all free um, so really haven't got anything more to say except thank you very very much Vivian um, and thank you to everybody who's come and thank you to Kate and I hope everybody has a great rest of the evening. But Vivian, do you want to say a last final word? Uh, sure, thank you everyone for joining and for listening and for the work that you do, even though we haven't um, uh, talked together, but I'm sure that each one of you is uh, an artist and a scientist of your own, contributing to this biodiversity. And uh, I just want to put it out there that if people want to follow the work, uh, you can follow on Instagram, uh, Vivian Sansour or our seed library. We also have a Facebook page, Arts and Seeds. But also if people are, are moved to um, support a, a new project we're working on, which is that we're trying to create a, uh, we're, we're trying to purchase a land uh, and turn it into a public trust and a safe haven for this biodiversity and for birds. And if you're interested in supporting in any way or learning more, uh, you can go to my website and there's a way to email us and someone will uh, respond to you. Um, but I hope you keep planting seeds and that... Um, uh, we will one day very soon be able to touch and smell and hug each other. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. Good. I'll end the meeting now. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.